Yeah, I will just give a, a very quick introduction about EXA Bootcamp. So um, most of you may already know us. So what is special about us? Well, we are all about uh, XR education and from beginner level to advanced level. And we always make sure that all our trainers are either successful indie studio, de studio developers or working at big um, enterprise companies such, such as Meta or Ubisoft. So when you're learning from our courses, you um, can actually be sure that you're learning the most up-to-date and the most professional learning education content. And I'm also inviting everyone who hasn't yet to join our XR Creators Discord server, uh, where we are already over 7,000 people. So if you have any questions about XR, feel free to join and ask any question you may have about XR development. And yeah, so that's basically, um, if you just look at the images, uh, there's a portfolio of our trainers, um, so we are very proud that there's many, many titles you may already have seen and um, already have played. And um, yeah, so feel free, we have lots of different courses from rendering opti optimization to, of course, our XR Foundations and XR Prototyping Bootcamp, where afterwards you are getting matched with open job positions. Um, so, and then, of course, um, the XR Design Fellowship or, um, yeah, what we are going to talk about today as well, the Apple Vision Pro Masterclass. And um, yeah, for the XR Design Fellowship, um, feel free to check that out. And also um, just uh, yeah, for our Beyond Inclusion cohort, we work a lot with different foundations. So for example, with the um, Jobs for the Future Foundation, and we are able to have a number of scholarships each time we are opening the XR Foundations and Prototyping Bootcamp to increase diversity and inclusion in the industry. So the next boot camp is going to ha happen um, second half late summer um, this year. Um, this is the current um, cohort they're about to finish. And yeah, feel free to apply if you're interested in starting your career in the XR industry. And it's good to apply early because there is a test, a C-sharp test um, you have to pass um, before you can actually start. So make sure you have um, enough time to take the free C-sharp course we have. And then uh, you will definitely be able to pass the test as well. Um, yeah, our alumni from all our beginners to advanced level courses are working at very, very different, very great companies. So they are also looking to always hire our graduates. So that's always a good um, circle to benefit from. And yeah, so um, also one announcement we actually just did a few days ago is our global XR hackathon. Um, which is going to happen across Europe. So if you're looking to win a great uh, price, uh, price pool and are based or want to travel to Stockholm, to Cologne, to Istanbul or to London, um, yeah, feel free to apply. We're looking forward to, to seeing many of you finally on site because most of our events are actually online. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to finally um, see many people here on site. And um, yeah, do you want to say a few words about the live course next week, um, James or Ferhan? Yes, definitely, definitely. Actually, this is a very nice opportunity that maybe we can share the link. Uh, would you mind maybe, can I share screen, uh, Rahel? So maybe I can share directly from the screen here. So uh, basically uh, what we have created is especially if there's a, a Unity devs here, I think it's a nice opportunity that you can um, benefit is uh, how you can start working on uh, Swift, right? Swift pathway. So we created this uh, decoding Swift for Unity Devs program with James. James has been working on this for quite a while. So uh, expect a quite an interesting uh, program. So the, the idea is here is much more like how you can learn the important fundamental parts and even a little bit advanced parts of Swift by already uh, looking at your existing Unity and C Sharp skills. Uh, if you have already an object oriented mindset, anyways, it will not be so difficult, but we are literally creating, maybe first time I have, we haven't seen anywhere before that we, for the first time we are creating some kind of like a comparison of what you know as Unity C Sharp developer and how you can easily map it out to the to the uh, Swift environment. So uh, if you want to start from somewhere, 
I think there is no other uh, place than this one that you can create. I heard that some of our um, some of our teams will also share some kind of like a discount code only for today. Uh, they will probably share in the next uh, uh, minutes uh, in the chat. So you can also uh, please, if you want to take, just wait maybe a few a few minutes so we can also share this discount. Maybe James, would you like to quickly share anything like a, a, which is a little bit more technical part? Anything? I think I think you covered it really well. My my main idea is when I got into uh, AVP development, I really didn't know much about the iOS except for a UND project I'd done five years before. Um, and I decided, okay, I need to put together a course of everything I wish I knew when I'd started that, because um, the hardest thing about a new platform is just the fear of learning something new, right, and starting over. And so this course is really designed to help people over that hump if they're already a Unity developer. And the purpose of it is, I think, now that we're expanding the way that we're doing, um, let's call it augmented reality for the moment, right? Um, if you're going to be in this world, you really need to know all the platforms. So if you know Unity, you've got a head start. You should know how to do it in Xcode too. Uh, ideally, as they get better and better, you probably should know XR Web and uh, Unreal Engine also, so that you can make the right choice for the kind of project that you're developing on. So this is really that first step of, you know, gaining the confidence of learning a new platform if you need to do that. Uh, I mean, I think we will talk a lot throughout the day today as well about this. So at least like on the concepts perspective. So uh, thanks, James, for bringing this interesting uh, approach to us. So we will easily pivot from C Sharp or Unity to, to Swift or Apple dev ecosystem. So it's a great yeah. opportunity. Um, another uh, interesting two events we have, you know, WWDC is coming. Uh, tension is increasing. So I think we have only 20 days left, right? Something like that, like 19, 20 days left. So um, we have two events. One is live viewing party, which you can join from anywhere in the world. It's actually ha always having fun because we are having so much fun because we we actually have a lot of discussion there whenever there's a new announcement. Like I'm looking at the, our uh, Apple Vision Pro announcement times. Everyone was waiting like that to, to see when the Vision Pro will be announced because you, you are seeing so much leaks, but you want to see what's the real deal. And if you are actually at WWDC or you are near to Cupertino Apple Park, we are actually throwing a nice party with the developers uh, joining to WWDC. Uh, so uh, please register from here. It's a waiting list, but we can definitely, uh, if you say round table, we can definitely uh, give more uh, uh, priority to you because as you can imagine, it's quite uh, uh, already crowded right now. Uh, and as Ryan mentioned, we have also Global XR Hack. So many events waiting for us. So we would love to, share all of these um, uh, interesting WWDC announcements and these um, learnings with you. Um, we have created, uh, if you can look at my uh, LinkedIn post, we have created actually some kind of like a schedule. So uh, I can, I will also share on the post so you can easily uh, link, you get the link, whatever event that you want to join. Okay, perfect. So um, shall we start if everything is already covered? James, Yosun, if yeah. you are available, we can start. Yeah, sure, so, let's get going. Perfect. So I would love to introduce uh, both of you. Actually, um, James, uh, I mean, they will probably introduce much better than me, but what I can say is it's not, it's not easy to find experts on Apple Vision Pro, even though there's huge hype while looking at uh, uh, masterminds on XR. Uh, on AVP especially, uh, it's quite hard to find. So we are really happy that James and Yosun is joining today because James will represent much more Swift side uh, since we have a little bit dilemma situation here today. And uh, Yosun will represent much more on the Unity side. And we actually want this to be as interactive as possible. So you can literally raise your hand and even not only ask questions on the Q&A chat, but also um, even contribute to the conversation. Almost think of like a Twitter spaces, 
okay we will do that on almost like twitter spaces but on a on a, a video format so feel free to join if you already built something on apple vision pro or if you have any critical question before you start your journey because we are expecting so much things on wwdc so um yosun is actually also uh, the winner of the uh, De uh, what was the name dev bootcamp vision dev vision dev vision dev camp uh, this is one of the first hackathons as far as i know on apple vision pro raven uh, did with james amazing job with jared to make this happen and yosun maybe you can also a little bit mention about that and then your the project that won that hackathon and uh, we can take it from there and then we can start the discussion yeah, um, so AI3D Camera Obscura is uh, the uh, app that uh, I made that one, the um, the Vision Pro, uh, Vision, sorry, Vision Dev Camp. I guess uh, they couldn't call it Vision OS, but it's Vision <laughs> Camp, and I, I, I often mingle <laughs> that name. Um, so I just pasted a link in chat, um, and um, basically it is a skeuomorphic app that lets you... Well, first of all, camera obscura. Um, has anyone heard of um, what that is? Do people know what a camera obscura, the traditional definition is? I think it would be great if you can a little bit enlighten us because even oh, I yeah. have limited uh, idea. I think it's also fun if attendees can turn on their video so they can like wave their hand or something. Um, and um, I don't know if that's allowed actually because I noticed no one is, has their video on actually. Uh, um, we we will we will invite people. So if someone wants to have a conversation and question please raise your hand we will invite you to the conversation like twitter spaces so uh, it's it will be quite interactive after the introductions i think we can immediately start uh, creating okay, got it. So conversation. attendees have their videos off uh, so we they can't yeah, just yeah but whenever we invite them uh, they can open their videos as well no problem okay yeah um i think that's kind of for you know pandemic style sort of you know post pandemic style even zoom stuff it's kind of cool where people can make faces and that's how you get your interactive feedback to people yeah. understand you um are you talking crazy stuff uh yes yes so yeah there in fact there is um that camera obscura and um so uh if you guys kind of um check out some of my past sort of hosts on twitter i kind of posted in progress um for a camera obscura um so i started just that that same concept with the mysterious thing in cliff house um that's always closed whenever you go because they always close on the dot and you typically don't really get there until after 5 p.m right um so i actually i don't know if i've ever actually seen it the actual camera obscura um but you can wikipedia it um and so what i built ended up not being a real camera obscura um it looks like it um and uh, and um well in xr you can turn your 3d model into pretty much anything same with pretty much any you know, AR app. Um, and so imaginatively, um, I uh, turned it into something that can convert your pictures into a bunch of 3D models. And this is where it becomes very interesting because we're basically on the eve of AI 3D um, becoming kind of the next big inflection point. Uh, many of you guys have heard about Sora and the AI generated videos. One major problem with these video generations is that they don't really have 3D perspective. Um, and, and so it's interesting that yesterday the um, stability CEO is like his next big project is like 3D, AI 3D, right? So once, well, there's also chicken egg situations. Unlike images, you know, there's like large, beautiful layout models and stuff. There isn't quite that for 3D. Um, so when we're, we're talking about large models, we're talking about hundreds of millions of models. Um, and uh, that is actually more than what Sketchfab and all these other things have. Oh, yes. Uh, anyway, so this is an example where you take an image and then you can segment it and then each one uh, can be turned image to 3D. And what's amazing is that image to 3D preview quality models, they happen within five seconds. Okay, so uh, this is a, a skeuomorphic sort of UI where I took the concept of a um, camera obscura and uh, that's the film plate. And so in this case, you're uh, uploading a picture. Um, and if you're wondering, this is Unity, what's just happened. This is launching, launching a Safari browser, which is using a React form, React web app to then upload to the server. So we have a UID connecting the Unity app to like the server. <laughs> 
uh, as you know, Unity is, um, has issues with like certain forms of a uh, file picker things at, at this point, I guess, um, and not writing your own plugin, you can then, you know, kind of hijack a web app to do that for you. Okay. So you, when you walk into the camera obscura, you can actually, uh, the control net, uh, basically lets you uh, turn the, your image into all kinds of different painting versions. And so in this case, we have like, as painted by, um, Van Gogh and like a few others. Uh, and then you can kind of drag the slider to see the original and then the, you know, the transformed version. Uh, so what's fun about that is they can easily get a stylized version of your of your picture actually. Um, and so that sort of scene got transformed to a masterpiece painting by our AI workshop of artists, which costs like less than a fraction of cents on uh, replicate credits. Um, and uh, all right, here is it. This slider, I'm a little embarrassed by. I wish I had more time to add some UI to it. Um, <laughs> this is actually uh, a raw demo from the hackathon. Um, and uh, let's see, just so you're aware of, uh, yeah. So the image 3D segmented that character, identified the character and then segmented. And then, so, And then uh, what are, I'm like, okay, it's nonlinear video right now. All right. So anyways, um, this is the original picture. And so that those are the uh, segmented items, the ones recognized as segmentable, like top confidence scores. And uh, um, we're using kind of a funky Z depth estimator to kind of understand where they are in the Z locations. Um, and then the X, Y is really straightforward. So yeah, within seconds each one is converted in real time to image 3d at this point we're using triple 3d um, nowadays we'll use instant mesh and that just gives you an idea of how ridiculously fast the ai 3d community is coming up with uh, state-of-the-art models basically um and uh, by the way the, uh, the thing i'm doing right now basically pinch gazing uh to move something it's a very standard sort of it's like included as a unity component um a standard motif for XR. Um, what am I dragging? Like, <laughs> um, and, and the other thing with um, UI is that that that's actually um, kind of a bad design choice. I should have had like a larger um, slider button because that was a little hacky to drag that slider. Um, this is actually a hackathon demo video, so it's a pretty rough cut. Uh, is are you guys replaying it right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> if you have things to talk, uh, definitely we can. Uh, but uh, I am actually, uh, I would love to hear James' opinion here. Of course, he was witnessing your project there, but um, uh -huh. James, maybe you can also introduce yourself. But it comes with a follow up question. If you want to build something similar on the Swift Apple ecosystem, would it be easier? Would it be so different in terms of workflow? So I'm I'm a total new buy. I'm sure that most of people haven't uh, so much uh, explored as much as you guys did. So can you a little bit explain like specific for that project? I think it's based. Uh, let's today let's really talk about uh, concrete projects or use cases. And anyone can bring their own project idea, and then we can even discuss which pathway it makes sense or what are the potential um, pitfalls, frictions. James, stage is yours. Oh, uh, so I'll say when I saw that for the first time, I was just amazed um, because obviously Yosan's a certain kind of genius, right? She looks at a problem, she starts pulling in other things that she knows really well blends them all together is constantly thinking them through i i this isn't how i approach work uh i envy people who can do that because uh, it, it actually opens up new doors right and usually what, what happens to create something really new is when you combine things that are already out there but people just didn't know that they could be combined and so what we see here is let's take a lot of generative uh uh, AI that people are sort of familiar with, maybe not super familiar with, combined with a new AR platform, which people are kind of familiar with, not totally familiar with, and 
just see what that experience is and keep polishing, polishing, polishing to create a really beautiful story. So, you know, this is everything that's the best part of software development, I think, and creative development. Uh, what I did was more stodgy. It was enterprise development. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time working for Walmart when they had an Apple Vision Pro project uh, at the end of 2023. Um, so my approach was more like, okay, so what's the business case? What, in a very vague way, do we need to do? And it's usually, here's uh, a bunch of shells. We need to get products on there. We need to move them around, right? So nothing really major, not really combining new things. And then, uh, and all credit to the developers I worked with who were brilliant. Uh, it was polish, polish, polish to take that very simple thing and make it actually work, make it work with data. And what we finally came up with, and this is something that according to news reports, um, Apple uh, was super impressed with, was that we uh, showed data on top of it and it's 3D model data. Um, and anyway, so that's the other approach. If I had to approach what Yosin did uh, in the, like Xcode environment, I don't think I could. I wouldn't even know exactly where to start or how to go through the hoops of trying to get, um, you know, tokens and uh, uploading images and all of that. Um, and she found a way to do this in what, two days or a day and a half, right? That's, that's genius. It's a different kind of development altogether. Um, I guess I am a little bit guilty for I've had a lot of experience building uh, XR apps. And before there was XR, mm -hmm. which I, I guess is augmented reality on a headset, I was building AR apps. And even before AR apps, I was actually building Flash with your webcam. <laughs> so <laughs> it is actually having had like a lot of experience of you take a new sensor and you have an app and you wow, this new sensor gives your app basically superpowers. Um, definitely with XR beyond traditional AR, you get depth perception. Uh, it, it's basically like, imagine what you want a AR to actually be. And it, you, uh, it's, it kind of isn't quite the same as you put your iPhone on a holder or iPad on a holder. It's because of depth perception and also the uh, amazing eye tracking and just everything also the amazing graphics on AVP. Um, and this is where I really kind of wish that Quest Pro um, had much better graphics. Um, okay, there is kind of a downside. Um, on a Unity side, most of your shaders will not be working um, because they're very stringent on, okay, only certain URP shaders can be translated, I guess. And this is where I'm not sure what if the word is translated or transcompat or whatever, um, where Unity shaders go into polyspatial native, uh, sorry. Um, AVP native from Polyspatial. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, when you build a hackathon, it really matters what your background is, I think, um, because when it's like an XR hackathon and XR is your life, basically, um, the analogy I'll go is this, you know, people are often like, if you travel and they're like, oh yeah, how long does it take to learn French if you're like an English speaker, right? And uh, <laughs> well, you can probably pimp slur, like crash course it or like falu or whatever, um, but you're probably going to be sounding like a tourist. And if you're going to Paris, all that French that you learn, people will not be speaking to you in French there. And so, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's kind of really the same. Uh, it's if you go to a hackathon, everyone gets 48 hours and you kind of come in with, all right, you know, starting from scratch, I kind of already have general ideas of you know, I'm very interested in kind of something skeuomorphic because that's kind of my current sort of, you know, focus area. And within skeuomorphism, there's so many possible things. Uh, as you know, skeuomorphism is taking real life objects and extract extrapolating parts of it to turn it into interesting UI, UX sort of um, reinterpretations, right? Um, and, and so there's so many historic objects of interest. And then you start like, kind of going into the rabbit hole Wikipedia for, okay, this is an intriguing historic object. Um, and uh, what's also amazing is that there's a huge community of people who actually created 3D models of like antique TVs, for example, um, and antique devices. Um, and uh, yes, we can AI 3D generate stuff, um, but um, it's 
we're not quite at the point where the AI 3D generation is fully clean models and the rest. Um, it's I would say more at preview quality, unless you're spending a lot of time cleaning up or you know running a very long generation cycle. Um, so Wait. basically, it's I, I mean it's not quite like 48 hours per se. It's more yeah. like you go in like okay, someone else put it this way. Um, it's like you go in as like a postdoc to like a I don't know, a kindergarten class or something. And you're all starting from scratch, right? And <laughs> it's kind of like uh, all of those years of experience, um, you know, it's uh, that intuition, um, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule, or I guess I heard about this word called Takumi, which is like the 60,000 hour or whatever it is. Uh, it all kind of, um, yeah, it all kind of comes together. Uh, and the ADHD advantage, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. But one one thing may be important. There is also decision makers in our audience today. Maybe if they want to ask some questions, imagine that I'm working on a big company, let's say airlines company or bank, right? Okay, my boss or CEO said that oh, Apple at WWDC 2024. I saw that Apple is so much committed. This is the future. Let's create our first banking app. I have zero team, but I have enough budget, right? To recruit, hire, especially in this kind of a job market, hire any kind of senior uh, developer. The question is, should I hire a unity team of developers, based a unity based team of developers, or more like a, a Swift, right? For specific use case. Uh, I think that's also something that uh, I understand, uh, like a uh, pivoting from one to another will take ages, maybe. Uh, but uh, from a beginner level perspective, maybe you can do stuff. But at least uh, from a decision maker perspective, you need to start from somewhere, right? You need to decide. So how, as a decision maker, I can be smart enough to decide what kind of workforce or team that I need to build based on my use case. Of course, we can talk based on use case. Maybe someone can even chime in to share their own use case so we can give some tips. But I would love to hear both of your opinion. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess in that use case specifically, you are some sort of, I don't know, JP Morgan, big finance company uh, and absolutely no domain experience here. Uh, typically what happens is you would basically get a agency of some sort or a, you know, a dev shop. And oftentimes... Yeah. They are not just Unity only, you know, because they're like, okay, so we actually need this weird login that Unity doesn't support this protocol, whatever it is. Then you write your own native custom plugin. And uh, I guess there's probably a number of Unity developers. This is not just a Vision OS, you know, Unity has iOS, Android. And a long time ago, Unity had Tizen, actually. Um, and uh, it's Unity is quite interesting because people mistake it as a game engine. But you can actually abuse Unity for a cross-platform compile engine. Well, what does that mean? It means that platform wars are kind of more for just social media bullshit. Um, excuse my um, words here. But uh, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could actually uh, you know, have your own single source space and just cross-compile it pretty much anywhere. Um, of course, um, uh, back in the day, you had to do a lot of your own tooling, your own UI system and the rest. Um, and even nowadays, I would say Unity's UI system still has like a ways to go. Um, but again, this is more with any particular tool set, you, you add your own use cases to it and you keep building your own libraries and frameworks. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it becomes your own sort of magic secret sauce, um, because you really know it, your thing. And I like making the language analogy again, because um, people who are native and fluent in a certain language, they've been speaking the language for like their entire life. Um, and this is where uh, we have our modern day sort of prejudices where, you know, a foreigner comes in and then, uh, you know, like, for example, they make uh, this sign instead of what was it, you know, that from that, you know, Quentin Tarantino movie, like, it's, what was it? Um, you know, it's like they make the, the wrong sort of hand sign. And all, three and, instead and of three. Like, right. <laughs> And all of a sudden, everyone's, oh my God, you're you're a foreigner. Even though they can get the syntax perfect, they're not kind of thinking in that way. And so there's also these kind of nuance, nuances where um, you can master just like um, a certain part of it, but because you're not quite, you know, there's still other aspects to it. It's programming is the same. You can be great at syntax, but your understanding of architecture, and this is the use case of this particular framework, um, 
I mean, you can use what's called a sledgehammer to crack a nutshell. And some people do that where it's like they try to use something. It's not designed for this, but they will, okay, just make really ridiculous. Just like, okay, let's use this for everything, which I think is a great exercise. But also, practically speaking, we're in modern programs are around for a long time. There's pretty much like out of the box solution for like so many things that you can kind of start out from, all right, let's modify this for that. And especially when, well, if you're like me, ADHD style, you have like 10,000 ideas before breakfast, in which case it's like, oh my God, you know, uh, I, you know, time means less idea time, other, you know, ideas to be built. And it's a form of anxiety that way. Um, I mean, it's similarly with like, okay, so there are these client projects and, you know, you don't want to spend that much time on it because they just want this and just build that, um, bring these things back. Right. So there are things that unity isn't that great at, and there are things that, you know, Swift UI is, um, but it's not really a choose this or that mutually exclusive dichotomy. Uh, typically, if you really needed to, you can write a native plugin. And in fact, Unity Polyspatial comes out of the box with examples of how you integrate Swift UI with Unity. Um, and, and so you kind of use what you need to. Um, I mean, it's it's just, you know, you as an app developer, you get the, the choice to, okay, I want to use Swift UI. Uh, and also I want to use, you know, all the amazing things that you probably have built in Unity um, with the exception that shaders are, you know, URP, you know, basic only. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm, I, as you can tell, uh, I definitely have this ADHD stream of consciousness, uh, and, um, uh, I should probably be reading some chat actually. Um, yeah, uh, I'm yeah. actually inviting them. Uh, so let them chime in. Uh, I think that's the best uh, thing, especially, um, uh, Rich has some, uh, suggestions, uh, interesting approach Sikar has. So I would love to, uh, hear them actually here, uh, to, to maybe talk a little bit about their perspective, how they and maybe introduce themselves first. Hello, can you hear me guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm a big fan of Unity since, uh, yeah, the AR wave, wave happened. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm kind of work, uh, worked as an um, as a mobile developer first on on actually Blackberries with Java, Java a long time ago. And then um, I moved um, because I was so excited about the iPhone 3 into developing um, with, for iPhone and becoming an app developer and buying my first Mac and a book pro and so on and so forth and learning Objective-C, even if it wasn't the best. Uh, I mean, for a lot of people, not the best uh, programming language, but uh, I just was so keen to make apps for for the iPhone, right? But then obviously the Android Android came and Windows phones came and that was a big mess for developers and also for for our clients because they want to want, don't want to pay more for uh, for a native coding for each platform so i was also looking for something to ease the pain so i found unity and because i want to move into game development anyways that was the first choice then at that time also because they they already provided some um some sdks for windows phones as well um and at the time i worked for penguin books so yeah, it's uh, really uh, something I never stopped uh, using from that day onwards. I also learned it, learned Unity at the Global Game Jam uh, in London, and from that point onwards, I never uh, looked back. I never, I mean, I never wanted to go back to code natively for either iPhone, Android, or, or Windows Phone. So, and with that, using it also with the um, with, with uh, Mateo and Fuforia later, and all the other SDKs, which are brilliant and all those plugins you can build for yourself um, for those um, target uh, devices um, and platforms is, is just a brilliant tool. And um, I like c -sharp because I grew up with .NET and XNA frameworks. So um, so for me, that's just one of the best ways of also um, utilizing that and switching also to back to .NET sometimes. Yep, so that's my, cool. and my experience is I, I use it even for like just business apps, you know, um, some people go with uh, a Flutter or, or whatnot, yeah. But um, for me, it's just Unity, and it works perfectly as well. Do you, do you do you uh, can you prove that same route for Apple Vision Pro? What's your experience so far with Apple Vision Pro? Uh, I mean, I haven't looked that much into that yet. It's something I want to learn myself now as well. I, I was also doing Swift a while back of um, and teaching it. Um, same with Unity. Um, so I think. It's if you're coming from, um, I mean, the brilliant thing is Unity, you can um, 
the Unity editor is, is so brilliant. Yeah, you can just do things, and while you're still um, it's still in play mode, you can still move things around and uh, push things around and all that. And and um, and it's so uh, you can operate on the open heart, which you can't usually in other cases so much. So it's it's a brilliant way. I mean, if, if you go back to from play mode back to edit mode, it's all gone, but you can there are ways around that. But I like to approach also to tinker around while you you're in play mode and while you're playing or your your app is actually in in a play playing state. And and there's so much more you can put, build editors which we use tools like our own own mini editors in Unity to use it for tools and conversions. So it has is very powerful compared also to Unreal, which I use as well for other projects, uh, which I sometimes miss those tools and I can use in Unreal, right? So and and even for Xcode, I've, I miss those tools I can build myself. You know the whole Unity, uh, like the editor engine inside as well is very powerful too. So it has for all those branches, and because of I worked so long with Unity. Uh, I, I think that's the way forward as well. I mean, obviously it costs a bit of money now with uh, uh, AVP. Uh, if you want to develop for it, uh, there's a license fee for it, of course, but I think yeah. it's worth yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's still worth it. Yeah, actually, uh, I'd love to hear especially people who actually use uh, Unity on Apple Vision Pro because uh, we are also hearing a lot of frictions, uh, stories, friction stories uh, from, from Unity devs. So this is actually an amazing environment which ones are just a some kind of like a rumor or not important and already fixed which ones are actually real uh important thing that we need to consider even today uh, so i would love to hear perspective different perspective here uh, sikar had some interesting perspective especially from a decision maker uh, uh perspective maybe you can introduce yourself sikar absolutely can you hear me yes yes yeah we will awesome. see each other we will see each other in a few days I guess uh, at Viva Tech event. Yeah, so uh, I am Sikar. I used to be a former XR Bootcamp uh, alumni. So uh, I've been a Unity developer for uh, for a few years. And uh, that was my main experience with building XR experiences mostly. And I'm more of a prototyper than a developer, which is really important for what comes next in my vision of using Swift versus Unity. I now work at Chanel where I lead the innovation program uh, with everything XR related. And I've been experiencing with the Vision Pro since day one, actually, uh, trying to build things with Swift Unity and not yet Unreal, but it's going to come soon. And I know it's not the topic for today, but um, my experience with Swift was, it's not just about Swift, but getting to understand the full ecosystem of Apple. And, and when you do stuff in Swift and something doesn't work, then you get, I at least I got a feeling that I do understand better why it doesn't work. Also, um, when it comes to UI and with the release from, it was at GDC that Unity has better support for um, the UI element coming from Swift. Um, that also helped, and I haven't been trying in depth the new, the latest versions of it. And I do expect the latest version of uh, Interaction Toolkit to help with that. But doing things in Swift and working with Swift developers was so much easier when we were working with full Swift environment. So. This is why I put in the chat that if I want to simplify, if I want to leverage every single possibilities of the Apple environment and working with experienced um, iOS developers, I would rather pick Swift, especially for my brand when we do work. Uh, we want things that looks really amazing, but don't need high interactions, then this is definitely the road to go. If I would need like more slick interactivity, very precise micro gesture, uh, full end tracking capability, um, like very versatile integration with custom tools, um, specific plugins I've been using in the past with Unity that I would literally need to rewrite from scratch, uh, then I would go with Unity. And I still have this open thing to, I'm looking at what is coming with Unreal. I'm, I, I'm really bad with shaders, so it's going to make things very simple. But uh, I'm just curious looking at it. Uh, but that's yeah, basically why I say it. If I need Swift UI, uh, if I need like sleek UI, and I don't have the need for specific interactivity, I just go the Swift road. If I need like more control over the interactivity, I would more go into the Unity road. And that's probably simplifying far too much 
but uh, that's basically how we've seen it. And from then on, this is more how we will try to see. Uh, just as a corporate, and this is really important, um, this is the question I would ask for all the developers that will work with me. Um, and what I see is that I have more trust from people coming from Unity because I trust they've been building XR experiences before. So what Yosun was telling before, like she got experience with AR experiences. Um, basically, you know 3D, but you also know XR as a whole. It's not just about like, are you able to put together a 2D app on the Vision Pro, but are you really able to leverage its special computing capabilities, meaning you do understand very well every single concept like plane tracking, image tracking, whatever is there. And I know it was available with AR Kit, but I find out like people coming from an XR Unity background would be much more, I would say, um, uh, precise and go in depth of the capabilities of it. I, so that's the way I thought of it when I went into the Vision Dev Camp, that obviously iOS people had an advantage and that they're familiar with Xcode and all the ins and outs and weirdnesses, right? But I thought, but if you're coming from Unity and have been doing HoloLens or Magic Leap or meta development, you understand 3D, um, I don't know what we're calling it these days, uh, spatial computing or mixed reality concepts much better. Um, and that would be a big advantage. And so the big surprise I got when I went to the Vision Dev Hackathon was people who knew iOS could figure out uh, those 3D concepts pretty easily just from experience working with games and other stuff. They would know what they wanted to do and just would have to research uh, how do I, you know, how would I go about doing that um, for the Vision OS? So I would say I, that's the way I thought too. And to my surprise, it's not necessarily true. It's really, it comes down to a matter of interest. Somebody who's uninterested in something may take a year to learn something new, like, you know, 3D headset um, experiences and how to do that. But if somebody's really interested in it, then obviously they can learn it in a week or they can even learn it over a weekend at a hackathon, which is what hackathons are for. So I don't think it's actually that much of an advantage um, when you come down to it. I think we, we also need to consider uh, these people coming from iOS background, were they trying to create a window app, volume app, or spaces app? I think that's also another thing that we need to maybe consider and start talking about while we are, because as I, I agree with Sikar, uh, I think uh, if you are really looking for a sleek UI. Can I, can I interrupt you there? I yeah. think Yosan and I had a, a chat over this about yeah. the idea that there are you know, Windows apps, volume apps, and space apps. And there was an article that Apple put out very, you know, at WWDC that made everybody think that's how it worked, especially when nobody had devices, but that's not actually how it works, right? Um, and I'll start and Yosan, you can finish if you want. You can have volumes right. inside of Windows. Uh, it, when we talked about the three, it's sort of about how does it start up, right? You can either start up with a window or a volume. Now, a volume really is just a window with a style applied to it that says, let's go into the Z depth too. So if we collapse that, you've really only got windows and spaces, right? So then the other thing is you can have uh, a windows inside an immersive VR experience on the AVP, or you can have a window side by side with other windowed apps. So even that distinction doesn't really make sense. All of these overlap. And I did oh. a, a video a couple of weeks ago where I start with the window app and I pop up a bunch of volumes and I go into a VR experience. All three of those can exist side by side. Um, so it's not really a useful distinction maybe. Uh, so uh, when your uh, Walmart app, is it mm -hmm. something that you used multiple of them or uh, how was it like, uh, how do you start, like how you approach? Back then, maybe there were not so much clear concepts while you are building, but... I, I, I think it's it's just do, do it any way you want. Apple prefers you kind of stick to a certain template for how apps work, which is always start off with a shared app in a window, maybe, or... Um, and the idea is basically like this. Uh, it's a translation of your desktop. On your desktop, you've got, uh, you know, the desktop and you have a bunch of icons on it. And I would say Magic Leap had this idea too. Magic Leap's idea would be, oh, in a 3D desktop, you would have 3D icons everywhere that you would tap on and they'd open up, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of what kind of what Apple is doing too, where they're supporting all of that. You can have 
your app startup as a window that exists side by side with other windows, like you've got an Excel sheet and a web browser and then this app that you just opened up. Or maybe you don't want it to be a flat window, you want it to be some sort of 3D ball that, you know, represents whatever concept you have for your app, or maybe it's a turtle app, so you want it to start up as a 3D model of a turtle, right? Maybe. You and that's, some, that's you, you have interesting approach, would you like to share? Um, sorry, I've actually been answering many of the Q&A questions. Yeah, so I, I mean, gonna... some of them, please leave some of them to talk as well. Uh, <laughs> if you are seeing some of them are really triggering a nice discussion, uh, especially uh, some kind of like a, a little bit of like a, uh, if you can create some kind of like a uh, environment that we have some people, Swift people and uh, Unity, and then we are a little bit uh, letting them uh, fiercely defending, I think it will be also great. <laughs> so it's it's just all about, of course, understand different perspectives here, right? Uh, it's just uh, like just to understand uh, how we can uh, decide as a developer or should we upskill ourselves towards other directions, right? So everyone is here, I think, for this purpose. So um, if you would like to, because especially on the chat, uh, Yosun, people may lose. So if you have anything to share uh, directly, on the camera, feel free to also share. Um, yeah, so I've been kind of going through a number of the Q&A. Uh, it's interesting that, by the way, people who are, there's chat and there's also Q&A. Uh, I think Q&A gives more of a structure way for us exactly. to answer. So, um, but I don't so know if everyone gets to see the questions or yeah, if it's, everyone uh, can see, yeah. Everyone okay, can see. great, yeah. So um, um, if you can, uh, everyone here, if you have a question that you don't want to ask, uh, in person, like uh, here uh, on the uh, uh, video, uh, you want to ask as a chat, please ask, submit on the Q&A rather than uh, on the chat, because on the chat, there's so much discussions going on. It's hard so to just, keep track, yeah. Yeah, um, it's hard to track, yeah. yeah so I, I think that, um, yeah, we were talking earlier about how spaces is, is actually, I think that if you see spatial computing, Apple's particular way of doing that as I don't think that other other platforms you can have multiple different apps all running around you, right? And so I think that right, this that's... is a first the shared space, and Magic Leap was thinking of doing it and talked about it, but never quite got to it. Yeah, yeah. And what's even more interesting is that you don't even need an app exactly. Uh, so Apple's USDZ Quick Look system, you can basically load any model, um, any three D model directly as its own. Thing. So um, if I had my Vision Pro on, I would usually have, I actually walk around San Francisco wearing this, by the way. Um, I would have my magical entourage with me. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, it's like imaginary friends gone real, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but it's really intriguing that anything that you Im can imagine and it can turn into a 3D model. And nowadays you have AI 3D, you know, so uh, but if you're more artistic, you can turn a sketch into a 3D model, which uh, is my SIGGRAPH real-time life project, Napkinmatic 3D from last year. Um, and the, things like that just allow you to be very expressive. And so... If you are a crazy person with imaginary friends, you can now show everyone your imaginary friends because they can all have them as like spatial volumes around them too. Um, anyways, um, so I guess spaces is very interesting because it mixes like your traditional window, like your finance sort of, you know, graphs and charts with say your imaginary friend, uh, <laughs> but, um, or say your camera obscura or, um, insert favorite 3D model that you can make interactive. Um, I mean, there's just so many different possibilities where effectively it is like, uh, to quote like Lucas uh, Rizzicato, that basically it's like magic um, because what magic people wanted to do was to turn lead into gold. You can basically do that in XR. And not just that, you can turn your lead into gold and turn it into an amazing sculpture that is now interactive and like whatever it is. Uh, and it connects to your finance app. You can turn your little gold sculpture into your new financial advisor, powered, powered by GPT-40 or something. And, and so this is like, it really just comes down to where does your imagination take you? And uh, well, I guess uh, if you are an app developer and you publish uh, on the app stores, 
marketing and business sense, I guess. If if that type of user doesn't quite exist, um, I mean, you can still build it, but you may suffer kind of low downloads. And, you know, this is the, the indie strife, basically. You build a crazy app and people don't really get it, but you get it. So the worst case is you are your number one user and um, you have to be okay with that. Um, <laughs> building apps for yourself, right? Um, yeah, I, I think that there really isn't much of a this or that. Um, and uh I mean, I feel like when people are first learning, it kind of feels like there's the prejudice of, oh yeah, I'm only a C sharp developer. I will not touch C plus plus. I will never do Unreal, whatever it is. Like, I'm like okay, um, well, uh, at a certain point, you kind of you learn all you can about this language, and you're like, oh, what else is out there? You know, it's like people back to the country analogy. It's like, oh, I am only from this country, and at a certain point, I think you want to travel. Maybe I don't know. Um, some people like kind of just staying in a niche, which I think is great because you become really, really good at it. Um, but there is always like you, you kind of peak and you're like, you kind of uh, what else? What else is there? Or say you run into use case where you have a client who like, oh, we really want some native integration that Unity, you know, just doesn't have. And you can either outsource that or you can do it on your own. But even when you outsource, it's kind of good to understand the underlying framework and the rest, right? Um, and so it's, yeah, it's ultimately it's up to you, your use cases. And even if you're a crazy indie developer, you're going to have crazy ideas and that you don't want to be limited by whatever tool set that you have available. Um, so it's ultimately up to where you want to take your projects. And, um, there is, I would say there is no right way to go about it. Um, there's a ton of resources available pretty much anywhere to learn anything. Um, and what's amazing is that nowadays you have not just, GPT, you have Claude, you have like, um, oh, dude, Google Gemini 1.5 will actually, um, you can, it has, it can Google stuff for you. So it's like an AI that you can literally ask any question. And it's like, if it doesn't know, it Googles it up, which uh, I think is, it's just, wow. Um, it's like having the ultimate tutor that knows pretty much anything. It's like, yeah. you, you don't need a computer book anymore, right? Where it's sort of random what information you're getting. You got to go through the table of contents. Instead, you just ask a question about the specific language feature you want to know about, and you get just the right answer. It's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I think there's like a question about like what the strong graphics card that I accidentally clicked answer live instead of type. Um, so I should probably... Uh, so I'm not really sure what the person meant about the strong graphics card. Um, like I think why you need a why you need silicon chip. Uh, I think Apple's system just works that way. You can't use an Intel chip. If you want to develop a Unity app for the Vision Pro, you still need to be doing it on a Mac with a silicon chip, the M1 through M4. Yeah, I think that's uh, what it's about. I think that Apple often will come up with systems like that um, where they, I guess, because they have a lot of they don't want to keep supporting old devices or say they want to monetize people upgrading and stuff. Um, I just, I mean, a long time ago, I actually used to hack and tosh. I had a netbook. Do you guys remember netbooks from like what, 2009, 2010? Oh my God. Right. It had um, Snow Leopard with um, Ubuntu and also Windows 7, like all of them running on a little tiny, it fits in your purse. Um, it's um, And it had what, eight gigs of um, RAM, you know, it was, back in the day, you know, that's the Hackintosh days. Um, I don't know if that's still possible these days, um, just because, well, first of all, that Hackintosh was a project, you know, it's uh, a pain to get three competing operating systems all installed and, you know, stable on a system. Um, I mean, I, I, whatever your resources, there is some sort of way if you really, really want to go for it. Um, but in our modern world, time is money. And so the Hackintosh will be its own project. There is, I want to say it's not ever impossible to use the resources that you have, the community that you have to do something, even when they're like, oh, this is like for, you know, Silicon Max only, right? Um, you know, but also like a worst case is you can say, develop your app using whatever version of Unity and hardware you have. And then just borrow a friend's computer that has, you know, Silicon Mac that, you know, just to build to. Um, I mean, there's definitely, I would say, don't let that limit you, I guess. Um, if say, yeah, I, I feel like if you're like, okay, I don't have the computer or I don't have the hardware and I really want to make it. I mean, I think that pretty much, you know, you can just borrow, you know, like build whatever, build on whatever you have, right? And then borrow, you know, or ask someone, hey, I need to borrow, you know, can you can you build this for me? You know, um, as in you can send the Unity project to someone and they can just build the polyspatial Xcode project for you as well. Like even if you don't know anyone locally. Uh, so 
just, you know, if you really want to build something and you don't have the resources, don't let that stop you. There's people out there on the internet who can, you, know, you spend all the time building something amazing and people want to help you to just, you know, turn it into a poly space shop or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Hope that kind of helps on, you know, um, accessibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is not, of course, it's not uh, as affordable as we hope for, but I think we are getting there. Who knows? Maybe Apple will announce a discount in 20 days. <laughs> Let's see. So, or maybe a light version, right? We will see how will it work out in the upcoming years. And I would love to also give the stage to maybe Erin. He was Erin um, Erin or um, Weird, sure. to Weird Toys brand. They they sure. were waiting a little bit for a while. So gotcha. who wants to start first? Uh, I can start first because I put most stuff in the chat and I'll answer. Um, I answered Weird Toys Brand's question. Um, so hi, Yosin and James. Uh, I was so nice to see you all. Um, Vision Dev Camp is really great. Yosin's, I know she wasn't there in person and she was DMing me on X and Twitter, but uh, she blew everyone away with her demo. I lo absolutely loved it. It is light years ahead of what most people are using, even for industry standard stuff. I'm really surprised Meta and other companies haven't developed things like that. The one app that I did plug earlier was uh, Runway ML. So my question is actually going to be about AI. So uh, I asked to present late since I know Yusin was <laughs> answering all the other questions. Uh, I usually ask this just to anyone at the hackathon is, has anyone else hosted uh, an LLM, which, you know, they're not really like small anymore <laughs> or large models, just model foundation models uh, on Apple Vision Pro. I know that I think, Yosin, you were at the, um, was it OpenAI's hackathon? I know a bunch of my friends were, were there as well, where it's like you're hosting an actual foundation model locally on device. This was actually brought up during um, the last debate that I moderated about two months ago. And the reason why I ask that now is because with the introduction of GPT-4, uh, oh, like that's pretty huge. Um, as I'm talking, uh, just as background with my publisher, O'Reilly Media, they weren't sold after I pitched everything. They're like, yeah, we probably should have a book anyway, but Apple Vision Pro sales are really down. There was a whole controversial video, et cetera. And it's very odd because O'Reilly Media's uh, primary audience actually is data scientists, AI and enterprise. They focus far less on AR and VR, but they actually wanted to see numbers proving, you know, there was more of an active um, developer community. And what I noticed was, you know, you know, folks that were at the, I guess, AGI uh, house or OpenAI's hackathon, you know, people are uh, developing with Apple Vision Pro, but hosting a whole model, whether it's Mistral 7B or something small, you do see people doing that more. I feel like that's happening more often. And the one thing I'll comment as a last thing with, you know, I mentioned film um, and television, you know, I'm working on I, confidentially some stuff that's going to come out in the next year. So next fall, and then the year after that for a full length feature, they came to me specifically because I wrote my book specifically because their uh, films were about the metaverse and AI. And also, you know, they're in talks with meta, but you know, they hadn't tried Apple Vision Pro. I told them about it. It's tougher, right? If you are doing something that's, you know, 20 to $30 million budget. So I, I, I mentioned film because the Apple Vision Pro, you know, De or sorry, for Vision Dev Camp, we had a lot of people also that are working uh, on film and television. Unity actually is not the preferred platform when you're doing something like at the level of AAA games and something high level. It's actually much more expensive. So they expect you to use something like Unreal. Um, and people who don't have experience with AR and VR, like some folks on my team, they had three weeks of of experience with Swift as C++ developers and someone else had like a demo of VR from the 90s. So, you know, I ended up PMing a team for the app rather than actually developing. So people are coming from all walks of life for this. What I would say is for Unity and Swift, you're going to look at different things based on the use case for me TV and film. It's going to probably be Swift and Unreal, not necessarily Unity. Uh, I'm wearing a Unity dev shirt. You know, they were a sponsor of uh, my book launch and, you know, three different heads of Unity from departments for research, uh, AI, and ads. Uh, Tony Parisi, who authored Git F as a format and uh, VRML, all contributed to my book. So my personal opinion is learn Unity, Unreal, so learn everything, kind of like what Yusin and, and James are saying, but think about what are the features. So my question both to James and Yusin is, what do you think about 
AI in general with Apple Vision Pro development, what do you see moving there that people are using um, or not using or what you think should be happening? Because there's a lot of new developers in the ecosystem, even from the AI community that are purchasing devices for the first time, uh, are deving on it, but it isn't, you know, kind of like hockey stick growth that we've seen since ChatGPT. Hence, you know, there's still a little bit of hesitation from my publisher, like, can you really identify the growing community that's there? Because I think it is there, but it's, you know, it's different when we're putting together a lot of new stuff and technology that wasn't there in the last five years. So let me pause, I guess, you uh, Yusin, if you wanted to start. Yeah, I think you have like five different questions, uh, <laughs> at least three of them that I can kind of remember offhand. So uh, <laughs> maybe you could like outline each question. Um, but I think the first one was like offline LMs, right? Um, so the amazing thing is AI, SOTA is like just happening like all the time. We now have like edge models. And so whatever you saw, like, I mean, like, I remember one benchmark was running stable diffusion on your iPad, like last year, it was about 30 seconds to a minute, which, as you know, is absolutely way too slow for SD, you know, because even on a crappy MacBook Air, it's like, you know, you can generate an image in like, at most, you know, 10 seconds, right? Um, so I think that it's kind of always interesting to show that, hey, you can generate it, but um, ultimately I think speed is an issue. Um, yes, it means that there's no server cost, right? Um, but I guess, yeah, when you use like edge, you know, optimization, ed edge optimized models, um, you can get speed. Um, but for LLMs though, it's like um, the, it's, it's, you know, if it's like a very basic assistant, I guess, um, if say you want to have a conversational partner who actually, you know, sounds like William Shakespeare. Um, it's not, the edge models are not quite there uh, just because, you know, to actually have their responses sound like Shakespeare seems to be a couple more transformers and other layers that um, may require more compute. Um, but yeah, I think that edge AI is um, possible right now. And time-wise, you know, within, you know, like less than 30 seconds for some, things um but for other things it's um i think back to how it makes sense to use a mix of both actually um like for example um i don't like using the web for object detection and segmentation because open cv can do that locally really easily and and free okay cheap okay <laughs> uh not just cheap free uh, well i mean you're using your users compute costs but they have a supercomputer so they don't even notice that it's you know running cv mask rcnn to like do real-time segmentation um, so it, it's kind of like if we have LMs running at like, you know, mask RC, mask RC and, you know, sort of like frame rates, uh, that would be amazing. And it, that's probably going to be happening soon, like in the next five years, uh, where, you know, the usual GPT-4 is so slow, like in, in five years, it's like, boom, it's happening locally or something. Um, I think that's one of your questions, like LLMs locally. I think that definitely is the trend. Um, like for fun, um, I, I kind of do hokey startups for fun, right? Last year, I kind of pitched a really hokey startup called mousepad.ai, uh, which is, um, I don't know if people are aware that AWS and the AWS, um, if you wanted to use an A100 AWS, it will cost you 250K per year. And that's like, really expensive for just like a GPU, you know, a single P was a P instance of AWS A100. And so I was like, okay, you know, like I was like, hokey startup, you know, each startup can save 250K per computer, you know, by having what people use in A100, having that run locally and stuff, right? Um, what's interesting is that there is now a number of other startups that are kind of working on the same problem, which is actually building, um, or just bring like what you run on a big expensive server and bring that into just local compute. Um, Athena is this way, okay, so, um, we now have supercomputers in our pockets or say, you know, on, on our heads, basically. And it, if the computing isn't being used, um, it's kind of a waste, you know? So um, whatever is now taking a lot of compute time on your servers can be brought locally. Uh, it's just a matter of um, focus and time. Uh, and um, and what's amazing is that, you know, there's actually SDKs that other people have to do that nowadays. Um, yeah, so I think that was one of your questions. And I don't, uh, the other question, I'm actually kind of a, uh, what are your other questions? 
<laughs> you asked so many questions. It's kind of like, oh, um... well, that was probably my main one. It was just, it was AI in general, but it was really about on device. And then I just wrote, yes, they got, someone got Llama 3 running locally. So yeah, I still have to try that out because I remember I was on Llama 2 and then, I mean, everything's just been released right in the last, um, gosh, week. And then now you also have, um, I guess Qualcomm has new chips with Microsoft. So there's a bunch of people just always competing on, and everything that you said um, precisely, it was in where, you know, early stage startups, like, and then indie devs, can you really afford, you know, as I ask people, I'm like, what are you using? Should I build a new computer? I don't have an A100. Everyone just says use AWS, right? So then what's sort of the workflow if you are going to integrate AI into an Apple Vision Pro app? Um, we did have one person at Vision Dev Camp. I think they were like Stanford students who like, you know, built Robin Williams or something. And it was like, you know, they didn't have anything super advanced, but they were just using ChatGPT for that. So um yeah, that was, that was basically my question. It was just local LLM stuff and then anything in AI in general, which you did hit most of the points there. So, yeah. If, if you look at the Google Gemini and uh, GPT for all announcements, something looks a little bit uh, weird, right? That they are always ha have to hold the phones instead of a smart glass, right? I think, I think uh, we are really one step... Uh, uh, a little bit like, uh, I think if this privacy and other stuff is not uh, a huge blocker, I think we would already be having this kind of like a smart glasses, AI powered smart glasses. So my question actually from AVP side, uh, Yosun, since you are already using, or maybe James, uh, any anything that limits your uh, camera and your uh, visual um, recognition from a privacy side perspective, because on Quest, it's almost uh, impossible, right? That you take direct real time um, feed. A AV AVP does the same thing. They've locked it down. Um, so we, we can wait. Any... So we well, there there's a couple of things. We know that Apple's wants to make an uh, AI play, right? A machine learning play. So maybe we'll find out about that at WWDC, and the they can still is... lock it in, but feed you directly to their uh, language models. Okay. Yeah, they and have the an amazing is... vision framework. Yeah, so um, huh. that you know, there's a, a lot of interesting potential. Um, but yeah, I think that having raw camera access would be would be great. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, what if what if uh, we want to use another LLM rather than Apple, you know, or rather than Meta? Uh, so how will it work, right? Especially. We can imagine that they will create something natively uh, or embedded so without you even uh, knowing it but i just try to understand uh, as hackers as developers should we always stick to the uh, the to the environment xr platform that we are working on while working with ai or uh, yeah so a really Thanks. Yeah, an easy way to get around that is something that again somebody showed off at the vision um dev camp which is you just get another little a uh, $30 camera, right? A $35 camera. You can stream whatever's in there to the headset and to your code. And if you're reading frames, that, that would be basically how you do it. You get around the um, uh, the camera buffer block by just adding your own camera. And you're going to maybe have a little bit of lag, but you could test out um, what you're trying to do as we wait for Apple to decide how to deal with this policy, right? And Meta's in the same boat. They know it's important, especially the enterprises, to have raw camera access because computer vision is such a well-known field now. Uh, and they just have to figure out the right way to do it. But in the meantime, if you want to test out, you could do it that way. Get a $35 camera and just uh, stream it. With our, with our um, experts on the collective, we are also discussing this, especially on the Quest side. I mean, the the, the best thing that we ca come to mind is uh, that we are also uh, seeing some examples, uh, screenshot your uh, from your camera and then put that to, to, uh, to the AI. Uh, if you don't need a footage, like a live footage, you just need a uh, one photo, then I think uh, one capture if you can solve your AI problems with uh, capture, then uh, there's there's another, I would say, uh, indirect way of uh, utilizing different LLM opportunities. Perfect. So uh, we will wrap, wrap up soon. I think we have 10, 15 minutes left. So before that, I would like to open up to um, uh, the questions. So uh, Win, right? Win, what your name? Weird yes. Question. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Tell, I'm just... tell us your tell us your uh, own uh, use case so we can help you guide you in the best way possible. Okay, thank you so much for having me, guys, and uh, I'm I'm learning so much. <laughs> um, I, I'm building a real estate app, and my question is about uh, user adoption. That's basically my main concern, uh, more so than than uh, Xcode versus Unity, because I realize that what I want to do is just get this product out there. And so listening to everybody here today and then thinking about what I'm really trying to figure out to this question is I realized that user adoption is the main question. So I guess, yeah, you know, I do Swift UI development and I've thought about creating an ecosystem for my platform with the mobile app and of course another app for the AVP. And so uh, I'm more comfortable with Swift than C Sharp. I've done a few things on Unity or VR, AR, but uh, my my native language is Swift UI. And so uh, I was just wanting, wanting to know your perspective on uh, any advantages or disadvantages from starting with AVP versus, I'm sorry, with Swift UI versus C Sharp for what I'm trying to do. James? We can't. Well, other people have mentioned before one of the great things about unity is just that asset store right if you know how some know how to do something go down to this c++ level or whatever that's really great but even better let somebody else do it and pay them 50 bucks and incorporate it into your unity app that's one of the things that makes unity absolutely amazing um but if you have a, a simpler thing you're trying to do and don't need all of those features i would just start with what you know obviously xcode um, the one caveat is something Yosin pointed out and I'd forgotten, which is if you start with Unity app, you can always incorporate uh, some Swift and Swift UI later, right? But if you start with Xcode, as far as I know, you can't do that. You can't ever incorporate your Unity com library or Unity components after you've started off in Xcode for your project. Um, and that's just something to be aware of. On the other hand, uh, one of the things and this is just a, a feelsy thing. I think performance is always going to be better if you start off with your native development, because Yindi's building a lot of extra libraries and adding them in, and all of those are going to sit on top of Reality Kit, right? And sometimes that's going to fit well, and sometimes it's not. Uh, my impression would be if you just start off in Xcode native development, don't worry about that. You're just going to get somewhat better performance as a freebie. Perfect. And and would you worry, what's your thought about uh, user adoption with um, AVP moving forward? I, I, I think there's, you know, rumors, there's always a rumor about the next AVP coming out for mass consumption, but. Uh, I, thought, yeah. I, thought the, I thought the HoloLens was going to take off in 2016. Right? I was going to yeah. be a millionaire. So yes, sir. Uh, I would say I, I've learned not to worry about that so much. Okay. It's all about the, it's about the journey at some point will, uh, hit that uh, inflection point for um, mixed reality devices. And if you've been following it the whole time, you'll be able to ra ride that wave. But yeah. nobody really knows when it's going to happen, right? Right, right. Yeah, I could probably speak there. Um, I also, I, you know, basically a Silicon Valley native. And so the big dream is always to build the billion dollar startup. Um, but as many of us know in XR, um, you know, there have been many inflection points where we were absolutely certain that, all right, this is, you know, the headset of our dreams. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that ultimately it is, and there's a uh, Tracy Kidder has an amazing book. Like it's uh, the soul of a new machine. Right. And this is kind of, if you think about like in, in computing history, you want to go all the way to like the Babbage engine, right. It took hundreds of years and. Uh, I think AI is really amazing because it's things that used to take forever is now happening. It's like being solved within like seconds, right? And so we're going beyond Moore's law now. There's like some very, it's almost at the point where anything can happen exactly. Um, and so I guess don't be surprised about a particular app making more money than like the entire headset, you know, like other other people building stuff for the headset or for example, um, and it doesn't even have to be an enterprise, you know, well-known brand name or something. Um, like there is still that kind of entrepreneur's dream that, okay, kind of this underdog, but, you know, we're going to build the next big thing. Like, I think that is so fully possible, even, 
<laughs> even though I feel like XR is, uh, people often view it as, oh yes, you make money from your enterprise client projects, right? <laughs> Which I feel like is, um, it doesn't really have to be that way per se. You know, the, the same tool sets that you learn to build these projects, um, you can build your own apps with. Uh, and again, when you have an app out there, it's uh, then it's marketing and it's it's a different game than being crazy creative. Um, but there's there's a lot of different approaches. Um, so don't let any of these sort of headset wars, you know, like, oh, Vision Pro sales have like, you know, started to like, you know, hit a peak. Like, I mean, that doesn't really mean anything exactly. I feel like um, people will always go, oh, yeah, this is, you know, Apple. You know, it's almost like there's an entire group of people going, hey, Apple, uh, you know, headset sales are hitting whatever. And that that creates free publicity. It's good publicity of all sorts. I mean, bad publicity is good publicity in that sense, right? So I, I think that um, if you have a vision, it's it's okay. Even if, say, um, it's not quite meeting. I mean, at, at this point, there really isn't any certainty for really, <laughs> will you become a billionaire building XR apps per se? Um, because you know, what if all of a sudden next year there is no AVP, you know, like they're like, oh yeah, our sales are whatever. I mean, this is again, it's hypothetical apocalypse here. I 99% mm -hmm. believe that that will not happen, but um, as just people in the ecosystem, you know, uh, I, you know, for example, Project Tango got cut, Holland's got cut, you know, um, like there's, and also if you're Unity dev, right, there, there are amazing projects you made in previous version of Unity was just like, okay, now you just can't even, you know, they don't work anymore because Unity, you know, often uh, different subversions, like things break and everything. Um, but again, software is something that's malleable. It keeps changing. Um, it's same with if you're a web developer. One JavaScript framework is the big thing this year. And then within the next year, there's a different JavaScript framework and everyone is like, you know, whatever, whatever is old and everything. Um, and so software is like something that you have to really just be on your toes like all the time, just keep innovating and just kind of be okay with whatever you built you might have to just keep, you know, scrapping it or iterating on it. Um, and, and so in that sense, uh, it's, um, if you start out as a founder, um, you will probably become a developer because it's not, <laughs> you can't just like get a budget to keep iterating. Like it's a form of madness actually. <laughs> um, but the drive I think is there and, you know, the vision is there. Don't let kind of industry forces stop you because there's always a way, you know, um, Perfect. So actually, uh, there is there is actually a very interesting discussion we did in the previous roundtable. And right before that, there was also a discussion. I just shared our YouTube page. Uh, I strongly recommend to uh, watch roundtable one, which uh, Erin was actually moderating. Uh, and uh, the the especially this uh, uh, puzzling places, bringing a Quest app to Vision Pro. Uh, Vin, I think that this would be quite interesting for you because uh, since Puzzle Places is one of the first, as far as I know, Quest apps that they built on Unity. Actually, they brought the whole game from Unreal to Unity uh, just for Apple Vision Pro uh, so that it can work. So um, it's a very interesting discussion. They already shared a lot of not only adoption uh, data. Of course, it was two months ago, but data is changing quite drastically. But they also shared discoverability as well, right? Because when we look at that right now, it's not only about how many headsets out there, but how I can make my app, which is decent enough, discoverable enough that I can monetize if I want, right? That's also another question, especially in the last <clears throat> couple of weeks, you probably have seen the uh, quite a bit of, even on, TV, uh, on X that there are lots of discussions between Meta and Google publicly, you can even uh, witness the discussion between Meta and Google there uh, that they invited to, to the store, etc., or to, to bring the, the, the a Play Store of Google, Play, uh, Google, right? Now uh, we are trying to, I mean, we know who will be the iOS of XR and space, but we don't know who will be the Android of, uh, of, uh, of XR. So now there's actually, it looks like there's some kind of like a, um, uh, quite interesting days, weeks, months, years ahead between Google and Meta. Uh, and Meta is now opening up with Horizon, right? Maybe you have heard Horizon OS. So I think um, exciting days ahead. So any other questions before we wrap up? Oh, there's actually a Q&A that just, uh, I just saw from Studio Billion. Um... Let's see. Um, 
Wait, did, did you just answer that one or? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we can quickly ask like, what do you think about gaming in AVP, right? Because you are doing pinch, pinch and uh, gaze, right? It's not as, uh, as the the input parameters that we used to. So how do you see how do you see gaming uh, ecosystem evolve? Oh, uh, I I want to say that you can do a lot more than gaze pinch. Uh, I mean, you have the ability to trap every finger. Um, you can and, do custom gestures, yeah. Yeah, you can totally do that. Um, and if you're indie game studio, I'm. I mean, come on, indie game studios are about just like innovating on new forms of um, HCI, basically. Um, I actually am of the camp that you should not be using controllers because that's like a long time ago we were not good at hand tracking. This is like leap motion days where you, if you give it a curveball like Mr. Burns, it just like fails, it blows up, right? And we're at the point where ML AI is like, you know, anyone can kind of train better tracking actually, like any, you know, eight-year-old kid nowadays, which, you know, um, which is really amazing. It's like, what if you don't want to track hands? What if you wanted to track, I don't know, like, I mean, you can track like, I don't know, like people's phones being waving, waving around, whatever it is, right? Um, and so it's not limited um, by controllers because you have basically amazing versatile 10 finger tracking and each of your fingers can be a virtual collider, right? Um, I mean, it's uh, whatever, you know, sort of interactive modal modality you're going for. Uh, and, and of course there's amazing uh, voice. Uh, for example, I run Whisper locally uh, and um, and uh, I, I saw questions, but they are all disappearing right now. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, anyways, it's, uh, yeah. I'm basically of the perspective, okay, I, like to conclude, uh, I'll give you kind of a perspective that is perhaps a little bit, you know, woo or, or kind of, um, um, I, I actually believe that much of the Vision Pro was kind of Steve Jobs' vision. And uh, as in, there is like this sort of by default, your eyes and your hands are how you interact. What does that really mean, right? Like it's it's almost like this is the true transparent user interface where computing becomes a part of you as the human. Like you don't have a screen, you don't have. Well, actually, currently we we are still using hybrid interfaces where the the touch type and all that you know the air type isn't. But I mean, take it to the next level, right? Where we get all of these kind of intermediary pieces perfected. So your eyes and your hands. And now kind of taking, you know, the end of Pierner sort of hikes, sort of, you know, go back in time to like ancient times where people believe in Atlantis and Atlantis, whatever it is, right? And so maybe a long time ago, we used to be able to do everything with our hands and our eyes, right? Um, I mean, currently what pinch gaze is being used for is say you have an object right there and you pinch gaze it and it just kind of whoa, it just kind of jumps right here, you know? It's like action at a distance. It's like basically having like ESP, you know? Um, and so if you wear your VP, AVP all the time and you take it off and there's like, you know, you have your your coffee on the, on the you know, on the counter and you're like looking at your coffee and you want to go pinch gaze it, you know? Like it, it's almost like, and a part of you believes that that's what should be happening. It, it, it's almost like training your it's mind. Like a it's a Jedi <laughs> power, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. You see, you have Star Wars there, actually. So it's um, it is actually okay. Then there's two perspective, right? And so if you're a realist, you're like, oh yeah, Jedi is like sci-fi. It's not real. But I feel like just giving the world this sort of optimistic, you know, like I I just feel like having Jedi powers is like cool, but also just at least kind of having some time in an XR space where you do have the power, you know, is like, you know, realist, it's the balance between the realist saying that, oh yeah, if magic isn't real, but then you put on the headset, it actually becomes real. It gives you kind of a perspective of interacting with the world that I think is definitely more, um, I mean, I always more prefer magic realism, right? Um, but, you know, there's kind of a, um, the world is a really big place, right? And we there's a lot of unknowns that we don't, you know, some people, they say we only use 10% of our brains, right? What if by using the AVP a lot, you start to kind of train the psychic part of your brain? Or I was like, this is getting very woo, right? And so it's like, as you take your headset off and you're just like exhausted because it's been like one of those crazy, like 40 hour days, whatever it is. And it's just like, you're so used to like pinch gaze and get move things yeah. next. And like all of a sudden it's like, whoa. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, with like 7 billion people out there, right? Like 
this somehow trains people to have Jedi powers, like for real. It's okay, that that that's the woo portion. Okay, it's like this is it's a really fun concept to think about. Um, but being kind of sometimes a pessimistic realist, I'm like, you know, yeah, that's probably just like a fun sort of thought experiment. But there's like a part of me that's an optimist that maybe it may help kind of globally, just like have allow humans to reach their kind of interesting, you know, psychic self actualization. Yeah. <laughs> But if you are asking me, uh, what will what will be the uh, what will be the uh, gaming future of gaming look like on a special environment? I still cannot have a clear answer. You know, will it be like we will be with our game pads on an 8K screen uh, on our uh, Vision Pro or another XR device? Will we be using pinch and gaze? Will we be sticking to hand tracking only applications? I still have, uh, I'm talking about like whenever the mass adoption of. I, I also want to say that um, I actually use the mouse uh, and the touchpad uh, with my AVP. And also I use a Bluetooth keyboard and you can actually, well, if, okay. So I mean, everything is possible, right? But my well, exactly. Is, yeah. Which one, which one will really pick up and then become really a, like a, a dominant uh, a choice of gamers in the future right so that's my question i'm still i'm uh, part of me also says that maybe people will continue because i mean uh, apple did a very good job right that low energy input right you don't need to even hold your hand i know touch. yeah uh, but maybe controller is with a haptic etc is still will be existing in the next 20 30 years on a even a spatial device playing on a 8k 16k uh, screen on your headset right not on a real tv so i still cannot answer these kind of questions uh, we still don't know how the gaming industry or gaming ecosystem will will evolve or how the future of game consoles will look like i think uh, uh, this is also an interesting question that maybe for the next round table that we can a little bit discuss this kind of uh, stuff as well uh, mm -hmm. I, I had to, um, I mean, we didn't have so much questions left, but uh, we are uh, running out of time now. Anyways, we are continuing this roundtable at least like a, once a month. Uh, we are trying to do uh, at least um, after WWDC, we definitely want to do a roundtable to discuss the, 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 the 2024 version of Apple's new announcements. So uh, thank you for everyone joining today. And I, I would love to hear at least like maybe last uh, a few words about like how we should, if we are, we are a, a developer, uh, how we should uh, guide ourselves if you want to sh share a few words before we closing in. Who wants to start? Yusuf. Um, yeah, I mean, in the future, we might even just have like BCI, you know, it's like in the matrix where within a fraction of a second, Neo was like, I know jujitsu. I mean, imagine that's the future of gaming, you know, where I guess we could be a futuristic, hyper productive species where people, their leisure time is just like a second of like brain sort of full brain interactivity or whatever it is. Right. And they happen to learn new forms of martial arts in like, I don't know, a fraction of a second that they then simulate in their head. And, and now they feel like they've had like hours of leisure time and they're going back to work or whatever it is. Um, I mean, we're at the point where AI can pretty much do all the mundane, boring things for us. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the next point is just trying to um, get everyone globally to reach their creative self-actualization. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm working on with the AI 3D Foundation to allow anyone to create XR 3D with just their ideas. Um, and, uh, yeah, stay tuned to, um, x.com slash Yosun. Um, and, um, there's also a number of like intermediary demos, um, on ar3d.dev. Um, and, uh, I think that many of the questions we were asking is like, how do I get started? Whatever it is. Um, I find that learning how to program, it's like what Jensen Huang said, you know, it's, it's just having to learn foreign language for most people. And it, as you know, all the LOMs can translate any language and speak with you in any language. 
Um, and using LMs, the program has already kind of been a thing, you know, so it's, you can actually write very simple XR apps fully, you know, using without any code at all, without using a arbitrary random tool that takes time to learn. Um, but, you know, imagine being able to have a fully expressive, you know, like if you're kind of those creative artist types, everything has to be perfect, right? Now imagine being able to instruct you know, an LM to do something perfectly and you're sending your artboards and everything. And it's like, okay, let's, you know, turn this into a 3D model, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, that is what um, AI Magical, AI 3D Foundation is building. And yes, yeah, stay connected on Twitter, uh, x.com slash Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yosun. <clears throat> With James, uh, we will have a few uh, things to do, right? The course is coming up. Uh, by the way, our team also shared the discount code if you guys want to join and uh, James' uh, upcoming course for uh, Swift, especially if you want to learn Swift. Um, the, the, the discount is uh, Dilemma. We put uh, the name of uh, the team of today. So James, uh, what's your maybe a recap of today? How would you like to guide us towards different pathways? Oh, okay. So takeaway for me for the day, especially talking with Yosun and just absorbing her energy is, like she said, it's not about the hardware. The future of AR is really about the software, about the killer app, right? And we're always going to be sort of swimming along, waiting for something to happen until somebody does create something really amazing on the software side. And the best way to do that is just to keep being part of the conversation, see what other people are doing. Because the best guess is the killer app is always going to be a combination of other much more simpler things that people have just pulled together in a way you didn't see before. So we know AR and AI, pulling those together is going to generate really new things. Maybe if we can find one more thing to pull into that, we'll finally have the killer use case where people will say, these headsets aren't just a toy. It actually allows me to do something that I cannot do otherwise. That, that's the ultimate goal. And once we have that, then, you know, spatial computing will really take off. So my takeaway is- There's, yeah. there's a lot that you can only do with a headset nowadays. Um, I think it's more about inflection points as well. There's what, five billion smartphones, billions of smartphones out there. Headsets are, um, to use the analogy for th 3D model training data, you know, we're not even at like hundreds of millions. And we don't really, if we were to train um, an AI model on the number of head, just based on the number of headsets out there, we don't really have enough of a data set for headsets, right? Now, whereas smartphones, again, we're in the regime of billions, like order of magnitude of billions versus like, uh, we're, I think in the tens of millions of headsets out there. Um, like I believe less than 100 million headsets are out there, but uh, I don't keep track of numbers all the time. And I've been known to misquote numbers. Um, and so this is also why headset apps are more expensive than your typical app store apps um, and the rest. But there are things you can only do on a headset. Um, it's just kind of a matter of um, like global utility or I guess different ways of, um, I guess, capitalistically monetizing it. Um, and I guess the question isn't about like the killer thing you only do on this because that's there's already things you can only do on a headset. Um, I think it's about adoption or um, it's like, well, what is the other, you know, like um, global adoption, right? Um, mass adoption? Yeah, global mass adoption, mass right? Adoption. Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, um, I think we have definitely a few more items to discuss. Let's leave it for the round table three, which we will definitely do after WWDC. Actually, there was an interesting question about collocation. I think uh, that's also something that we have not talked today, right? Special personas. I think it's nice that we haven't talked because some we have heard some rumors that there will be some special personas focused uh, announcements uh, in the next 20 days. So I think it's much better that we maybe uh, leave that topic to, 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 uh, to the next one. Um, and if you guys have any suggestions, please uh, join our Discord server and then even share what kind of topics that you would like to hear in the next uh, next roundtable. We will continue doing that as long as there is interest. Thanks for everyone. Wait, wait I, I just want to mention, I noticed yeah. that Dan Miller is in the chat. So he can probably yeah. tell us about, if anyone yeah. has questions on Unity Polyspatial, Dan Miller is here, actually. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, already, I already invited, but I don't know. He's, I think, a little bit busy. I don't know if he has, uh, he can uh, open up mic right now. But I just, uh, I'm really flattered that Dan Miller, uh, who is actually the person behind 
for the special is uh, here. So we are very honored to have him at least. Uh, he uh, he's at least uh, listening to us, so not get bored uh, of our discussion. So that's that's great news. So we will continue about uh, this. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. And uh, Dan is saying that it's exciting conversation. So then uh, with your uh, support, then we will continue this roundtable discussion. Uh, it's always interesting to explore different perspectives. Again, thanks everyone for uh, staying uh, almost over 90 minutes with us. Uh, we will continue, uh, continue creating content courses for you. This Swift course is just the beginning. It's just, Im imagine this almost like a module zero. Uh, we have some big announcements with James as well for creating full-fledged masterclass for Apple Vision Pro. But step-by-step, uh, step, we will announce uh, uh, more in detail after WWDC. Uh, if you are joining James' course next week, uh, we are hoping to see you there next week. And thanks, everyone, joining James, Yosun, uh, Rich, Erin, Sikar, Dan, Dan, Vin, Rahel, everyone. Thanks for joining and uh, hoping to see you in the next open lecture. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.